But this evening, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. What is this strange thing coming through our windows, this sun? Isn't it wonderful? I love this part of spring, or almost spring. As time changes, the seasons change, the word of God stands forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I'll be reading verses 19 through the end of the chapter and even one verse into chapter 8. So 7, 19 through 8, 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 19 through chapter 8, verse 1. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things. And to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which may, I'm sorry, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. Thus far, the reading of God's word, let me pray now for the blessing of the preaching of it. Lord, as I've already asked, I would ask again that you might grant to us wisdom and understanding of your word, and in doing so, better understand the way life works. Lord, the humility that comes with it that you are the only sovereign, that you are the only one who dwells above the sun, that you see through that crystal sea clearly, and not only see, but decree, for you are the only sovereign. And so as creatures, Lord, give us a humility that comes in understanding that we are made by you and for you. And so make us people of the word, students and lovers of that which is good, so that we might please you all of our days and bear witness to the truth that Christ is risen and Christ is coming again. Make this true for us, Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. We come again to this wonderful, difficult, challenging book written by Solomon that is part reflection of a life at times well-lived and at times a life very poorly lived. Uh, Solomon is not, in all of his choices, exemplary. A man with 300 wives, 700 concubines, he was at most busy. (laughs) Um, A lot of folly and towards the end of his life is reflecting upon his experiences. Children, I want you to understand something about your parents. They are not all that they need to be, but they are what God has given you. And they at least know this a lot more than you do. Much of that has come by failure, like Solomon, and some of that has come by observing and avoiding All of that has been given to them by God in order to show you how not only to live, but how to think of life and how to live in such a way that your countenance is not so soured by the many manifestations of the depravity of men. God wants us to be cheerful. And the best way 
Solomon knows how to tell us to be cheerful, to have faces that shine, according to chapter 8, verse 1, is to see things as they really are. And to not be so thrust into the chaos of it, but to rise above it through this precious gift called wisdom. As we do that, I want to look at this text under two headings. The first, wisdom gives strength. Wisdom gives strength. And secondly, a little more colloquially, wisdom helps deal. Helps you deal the problems of life. Wisdom helps deal. Let's look at this first point this evening. I came to an awareness of the fact that there's some of you out there that often wonder how long I'll preach in the evening. Now, let me say something. This is a dangerous game you're playing. (laughs) Because if I have been given any gift by the Lord, it is the gift that can best be described as, draw it out, draw it out. I may not be able to hold a note, but I can hold a concept. I don't want to take up too much time, um, but I do want us to look at this matter because I think it will be helpful And for someone who I I hope has learned something from the book of Ecclesiastes, there is much in here for us, especially because we live in an age of such folly. You know what they say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Getting some of this will help you. And as those whose faces shine with the radiance of wisdom, people will look at you and they'll wonder, what is that guy, what is that gal got that I don't have? Let's look at the first point. Wisdom gives strength. Look at verse 19. (laughs) You can wonder, where did he get this point? Well, it's right here. Wisdom gives strength. That's what they pay me for. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man, more than 10 rulers who are in a city. Now, I know that this is our tendency. When it comes to right and wrong, Life itself, we often want to paint in colors that are black and white, either or, this or that. But what Solomon is often doing in the book of Ecclesiastes is he is painting a picture of that which is better than something else. Yet despite the fact that something is better than everything else, even if you apply that which is better, guess what? You're still under the sun. Because what we want to do is once we solve the equation that unlocks life, what lies behind door number one is a life of perpetual ease. But if you were to show up at that game show and there's door number one, two, and three, and you open either one of those doors, at the entrance of that door, what awaits you is life. Congratulations right? Even if you win all the money at Will of Fortune, you still have to pay 45% in taxes, right? So there you go. Welcome. Welcome to life. And Solomon does not want us to misunderstand the wisdom that he is dispensing with in the book of Ecclesiastes by the Holy Spirit is not something that can cause you to just check out, to live in your high tower, but how to engage in the life that God has given. And so he begins, wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than 10 rulers who are in a city. Now, he's not saying it is wrong for a city to have rulers, but that one wise man is better than 10 rulers, especially 10 fools who run a city. And we know something about fools, right? who not just run cities, but states and countries. We see them all around us. And the way that we often see them is their folly is directly related to the kinds of lives that we are endeavoring to live. But wisdom gives strength. And one wise man is better than 10 rulers. Now, the reason why we often think of a multitude of leaders as better is because every man, woman, and child is faced with an unavoidable reality, and that is this. More people, more problems. As soon as people come together and they form a city, what do you do? What do you do with waste? Have you ever been to a large concert? There are whole companies, and the money that they make is how to deal with the waste of thousands of people in one centralized location. 
Now take that as a metaphor for sin. How do you deal with the waste, the indelicate nature of all men? There is a sin problem that afflicts all people. In fact, he goes on to that. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Reformation OPC is a gathering of people who may be good and striving to be good, but they're not only good. You are an infinitely complex human being, and it's one thing to endeavor to understand God. It's impossible to search out his ways. He is inscrutable aside from that which he has, re has revealed to us. What is also difficult is to describe men. Now, there are people whose lives are spent and they make good money on television telling you when the rain is coming. Given a short enough window, I can tell you when the rain is coming. <laughs> but what you and I cannot do, not only to search out God, but even to search out creatures, in fact, that's sort of how Solomon closes this chapter. I can understand one man in a thousand, but I love what he says. I've never understood a woman. And it's funny, isn't it? It's sort of a joke, but it's not. There is an inscrutableness to the nature even of men. And so what fools, what sinners, what the weak endeavor to do is not to look at the sinfulness of men and say, I understand where that comes from, and I know what the solution to that problem is. But what sinful men endeavor to do to control other sinful men is what? Bureaucracy. Now, what I am not saying is that government is a necessary evil. Government is a necessary good. And there are many laws in Scripture that tell men how to rule well over men, whether it's in the family, in the church, or at the state level. And in any of those spheres, God has given an abundance of instruction, but he's also given us this instruction, how to care for the poor, but also that the poor will always be with you. Here is how you care for them, and then here is the reality that you will never stop caring for them. You can never solve the problem with the stuff of earth, this problem of scarcity of resources. And so what men endeavor to do is they centralize authority at the top and they think that by shows of power they can control and promote well, maybe their own version of righteousness, but at the very least, the alleviation of what the Bible calls sin. Parents, you are prone to this, right? It's if I hang on even tighter, if I speak a little louder, if I death stare my child a little bit more, they're going to look at me and go, I get it. You're so right. I am a sinner. And for all the things I've done, I am so, I've never in my life encountered that reaction from even my own children. I was not that child. I was the child who when my mother spanked me and it didn't hurt, I turned around and I laughed at her. I think I've told this story a multitude of times. Now, rightly, when my father came home, he applied the, the rod of knowledge to the seat of discipline. And I didn't laugh that time. I wailed. Lord, have mercy on me, for I am a vile offender. My father knew in some fashion what the, the interruption to my behavior needed to be. That was a wise man. That was a wise man. And it continues to this day to be a wise man. And because of his wisdom, I was blessed. I would not have said it at the time. Thank you, Father. But I say it now. The reason why wisdom is important is because it gives strength 
to a situation where there would otherwise be great chaos. And so we look at the world around us, we look at the culture in which we are placed today, and what we find is this. In order to solve the problems of the world, we must simply apply the stuff of earth to those problems. There's a way out of this. And so people will make promises. They will beg, borrow, and steal. They will do whatever is necessary, whatever they think will work, in order to solve the problems of the world. Here's the issue. As soon as you figure it out, baby number three, four, five, six, seven comes along, and boy, it interrupts that little bit of peace you may have had. Someone comes into the church you are not prepared for. And their life, the decisions they make, throw a wrench into the works, and you think, we just had this figured out. But did you? In fact, this is the question that Solomon wants us to ask. No man is only righteous. All men will sin. And so, 21 and 22, do not take it to heart when people sin. Parents, when other parents come to you and say, your kid did something, don't go, <gasps> not my precious Johnny. Yes, your stinker. He did that. He pulled her hair. He said a word he should never have said. And it's not just the boys. The girls can be stinkers too, can't they? And they, they bat their eyes. Yes, I know. I'm a father of daughters. And I tend to be a little softer. Although the longest eye roll I've ever experienced was given to me by my seven-year-old child. I mean, it went on for half of the lunch. What is she doing? She's, as we say in my house, showing her fanny. She is showing us that as sweet as she can be sometimes, there is a seedy underbelly to everyone. Everyone. Now, when a seven-year-old does that, it's not nearly as destructive as when a nation, an emperor, a king, a president, a prime minister... More people, more problems. And so the advantage that a wise man has and the strength that wisdom gives is the strength to not react to every single occurrence of sinful behavior and go, oh, because when you're in that shock, some people call it the OODA loop, look that up. The shock and dismay that sinners act sinfully they don't remember the real remedy. They think what? I just need to hit harder next time. More laws. Let's just pile up the laws. Let's just make it so that every single element of human behavior is governed by some jot or tittle. And so one of the reasons why we gather a host of counselors, rulers, leaders, and we even allow ourselves to become imprisoned by even greater bureaucracy is because we want that person to take care of my problems. Help me deal with my sins. And instead of seeking out wisdom and real righteousness, we seek out the enslavement even of those who are unrighteous. And so Solomon says... Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. I have to be reminded this all the time as a father. Didn't you do that when you were a kid? Well, <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, I remember. But, 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 no, there is no but. One generation declares the glory of God to another because every generation of man loses the plot without that covenant faithfulness and without a constant reminder of what God has done, who he is, the offer of salvation that he grants to us, even though we are not only good, but we are sinners. We lose the ability to see people as they really are. And so wisdom is essential if we are to understand the way people are. And you think, man, I cannot wait 
But the end of the day of a biblical anthropology is, oh boy, I've got my work cut out for me. This is a serious mission. Wisdom acknowledges the truth that there are no only good people. And so, for this reason, if you're a righteous man, do not be dismayed when others do not believe as you do. Live as you strive to live and worship as they and you have been commanded to worship. Wisdom admits who people are and never promises something that they are not. This is, this is part of even premarital counseling, right? The person that you are marrying is, what does Solomon say? Surely there is no righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Boom. It's that mic drop moment. So what does wisdom do? It not only gives strength, but it helps you deal. Now, what Solomon realized in his observation is the inability to reduce or condense life into a simple algorithm. Now, children, do you know what an algorithm is or an equation? Here is a very simple algorithm. One plus one equals, you can actually answer if you want to, not 11. I'm just kidding. It's my son. Two. Two plus two is not two. Four. I thought it was simple. So this is what we want to do. We want to bring all of life into a very simple equation. And here is the equation that modern men have come to. You, my friend, are an animal. Your descendants are monkeys. And we have no origin in the heart and mind of of an intelligent designer. Do you know why they use that algorithm? Because it removes the sovereignty of God from the equation, and it actually makes life, in their opinion, easier to deal with. But the problem is this. Once you take out the essential origin of all things, you can't do math anymore. And as Solomon is looking, what does he say? I turn my heart to know, verse 25, and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness, and I find something more bitter than death. Now here, he talks about the enticement of men by women. He's talking about the, the unavoidable nature of sin. And as soon as you have things figured out, here comes something that brings dismay to you. Why do people say yes to the things they should not? Now, this is Solomon, right? The irony is thick. 1,000 women. Solomon should have said no 999 times. He should have said yes once. He got the algorithm wrong a lot. But what he realized is math, sorry, wisdom is not the, the means by which the ability to reduce all of life into an understandable equation, but to leave the math to God and to receive providence as he has given it. And men as they are, and women as they are, and children as they are. And when I say leave people in their sin, that's not what I'm saying but that people are, by nature, creatures of wrath, totally depraved. And though they might not be as sinful as they could be, they are born and conceived in iniquity. This is straight from the Psalms. And he says, who does? It doesn't make sense. Sin makes no logical sense, does it? You willfully, willingly, cheerfully choose something that damns you to hell. What are you doing? And you look at other people and go, what are you doing? How can you do that? And they would look at you and say the same thing, right? Every loss of control and anger, every lust, every covetous thought, it, sin is inherently 
illogical if God has called you to holiness, and he has. It makes no sense. Why do we act this way? And so Solomon says, um, behold, this is what I found. Verse 27 says the preacher, or Kohelet, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul has repeatedly sought, but I have not found. <clears throat> He's adding. Let me see if I can figure this out. And he thinks, oh, I think I got it. No, no. I don't understand the scheme of things. And here is my application. You shouldn't try and you should be okay with it. God does know the scheme of things. And despite knowing that we are sinners, and despite the fact that he knows that you will go home and sin tonight or tomorrow, he loves you and calls you. You are his children because he is patient. He understands the algorithm that is you. And his countenance is not changed by your stupidity and your folly. In fact, he pursued us nonetheless while we were foolish and set in our sins. And so Solomon then applies it just to men and women. One man among a thousand I found. What he's saying is, I've, I can understand one man in a thousand, a simple man. I love what he says. A woman among all these I've not found. And he had a thousand. I don't understand a single one of them. And all the men said, amen right? And we use that and we kind of joke, but isn't that sort of the blessedness of it all? And they say, well, we're just trying to keep you on your toes. And I say, okay, good. I need it. <laughs> so don't trust the man who says he has it all figured out. He's lying and he knows that he's lying and he's just trying to sell you oceanfront property in Arizona, which is also the name of a George Strait breakup song which you may or may not be familiar with. I've got some oceanfront property I want to sell you in the desert. Thank you. They're lying to you. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, arrayed in beauty and glory and might, could not figure it out. But what does Solomon know? Well, look at verse 29. He does not know why sinners sin, except they are sinful. But this he knows. See, this alone I found. Children, young people, I want you to listen because it is the one thing that Solomon found. It's key to living a life of joy. I found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. It's total depravity. It is theology proper or a good theology, that God is the one who made us holy. But man fumbled the ball. We botched it. We messed it up. We sought out our own schemes. That's the problem. And so the techniques of men, the bureaucracy of nations, the imposition of authority will not solve a problem that only Christ can, by his Holy Spirit, solve in you. And I don't mean perfection. We're not Methodists. We're not Nazarenes. We're Reformed evangelicals. And what we say is this. Perfection awaits us in death, in the mortification of our bodies, or in the return of Christ, whichever comes first. What we do know is this. God made men good. Men messed it up. And we continue to fumble the ball. We continue to make obscene decisions. We continue to try and fail. And so we come to this conclusion. You cannot solve the sin problem with the wrong tool. Stop being surprised by the sinfulness of sinners and start using wisdom to engage with them unto repentance, not perfection, but sorrow for sin and striving. A righteous man falls, but he gets up a thousand times. Sorrow for sin is the engine that drives repentance. 
Do not be discouraged by the presence of unbelief and the inability of men to solve this great problem. Rather, in your speech, in your conduct, drive people to the cross of Christ Jesus. If you try to solve sin or the sin problem with the wrong tool, it's like using a screwdriver to hammer a nail. It doesn't work. It only brings frustration. It's a lot of sweat, maybe blood, and some tears, but that nail's not going in that piece of wood. You cannot hammer a nail with a screwdriver. Men do not put men back together. Only God can do that. Now, he uses means, but the means that you might be, you're only effective when you use the word that he has given. What the world needs is the hammer of wisdom, not the screwdriver of folly, to continue that strange metaphor. Drive people to the true light of God's revelation. And so Solomon is saying, in sense, what we are to do is we are to rise above the chaos of the constant surprise of ourselves by the sinfulness and the depravity of men. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I wish I smiled more when I was correcting my children. (laughs) That's what it comes down to. I wish my children's behavior did not dictate my emotions. Do you know why my emotions change when my children are acting like cretins? Because I think I can control them. And I cannot. Boy, it is no end of grief. And as soon as I say that, I'm going to mess it up this week, right? I'm going to yell. I'm going to get upset. And it's not because God has been offended. It's because I've been inconvenienced. But what of the Christian? What of the Christian that lives in the world, a Sodom and Gomorrah kind of place, ancient Rome, 21st century America, and you see all of the ungodliness around you, and what you want to do is you want to go and you want to scream, you want to push people's heads through concrete walls, and you want to say, will you just please do the right thing What Solomon is talking about is the kind of Christian life that we find in 1 Peter chapter 3. In fact, I think this is a great extension of this concept. And if you have your Bibles, you should. We're at church. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. Let me just start in verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, then for doing evil. What Solomon would write, if he were writing 1 Peter chapter 3, would be, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for why your face shines, even when it doesn't seem like it should be. This is why Christians are staying behind in Ukraine. This is why we open the doors of this church. This is why we gather for worship on Sunday. Because the only people that can handle the fact that all men are sinful are people who understand where sin comes from and how sin can be dealt with. We have the cure, right? Well, when I say we, we know Christ. And because we know Christ, we can be joyful even when people are scoundrels. 
And when they see our shining faces, by God's grace, they say, how do I get that? How can my face shine? And what do you say? Here's Christ and him crucified. Believe upon him and you shall be saved. And then what the Spirit will do is they will come into that person's heart and they will take care of those problems over time. Not fully, not finally. That happens in the new resurrection, right? But they will work on their hearts unto the end of righteousness. Let's pray. Oh, Lord our God.